2 Timothy 1, verse 5, we've been looking at for some weeks now, talking about faith and a particular kind of faith. 2 Timothy 1, 5, he said, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded that in you also. He said, there's something in you, Timothy, that was in your grandmother, also in your mother, and it's in you, and it's faith. But he qualifies it. He uses a descriptor. He said, it is unfeigned faith. Another translation says unhypocritical faith. Another translation yet says genuine faith. Another translation says true faith. Why would he say true faith? Feign literally means pretend like an actor. That's what hypocrisy is, is taking on a role, assuming a role or a character, acting. If there's unfeigned faith, what else must there be? Feigned faith. If there is unhypocritical faith, what else must there be? Hypocritical. hypocritical faith. If there is genuine faith and true faith, what else would there have to be? False or fake faith. There is a fake faith. Second Corinthians, the 13th chapter, 2 Corinthians 13 also says this in verse 5 in the NIV, said, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. The New Living says, examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. To see if your faith is genuine. So, are we supposed to, according to the Scripture, check up on ourselves? Examine ourselves to see what? Is this really, is what I'm calling faith, is what I'm calling believing, is it really believing? Is it really faith? Uh, and, of course, this applies to who? You. Me. Us. Let me encourage you. Check up on yourself. Every time you hear out of your mouth, I'm believing for, I'm believing that. Don't just say it randomly. See, it, th these terms have begun to be thrown about loosely in our circles. Well, just believe with me on this. And, and just be in faith with me about this. And, and I'm in faith. I'm believing this is going to happen. I, somebody was telling me the other day, I'm believing that so-and-so is going to do such and such. I said, how? They said, what do you mean how? I said, how are you believing that? They looked at me like I slapped them with a wet dishcloth. They're like, I'm, I'm just believing. No, faith is not based on nothing. How are you going to say you're believing that I'm going to do something? The only way you could really believe that is if I told you I would do it. There's a lot of junk going on now in the name of faith. I'm believing that this is going to happen. And they're no more believing it than anything. They're just talking. And, and some say, well, well, what's wrong with that? Everything. When you talk stuff and it doesn't happen, it hurts your faith. I'm believing for this, I'm believing for that, and you're just talking a bunch of empty talk and things don't happen, don't happen, don't happen. You get to where you don't expect what you say to happen. You get to where you don't expect what you pray to happen. It hurts your faith. You'd be better off saying one thing and it happening Amen. than 90 things and only nothing happening. Be, be selective and you'll be effective. I didn't think that up. The Lord told me that years ago. <laughs> he, said, uh, he said it this way. He said, Keith, 
watch what you say, watch what you pray, if you'll be more selective about what you pray and what you say, if you'll be more selective, you'll be more effective. And so there are times that, you know, I, I remember talking about Brother Hagin a while ago. Uh, he said uh, years back, his, uh, one of his children had a physical issue, and they called, let him know on the phone. He's out on the road in meetings. Uh, they had them longer then, weeks at a time, sometimes six, seven, eight weeks in the same place. And uh, his uh, child has got some symptoms. And he said it wasn't anything life-threatening. And he knew he's been teaching on healing. He's been healed miraculously himself when he was 16. He's been preaching and believing healing for decades already at this time. But he said what he did is he would uh, feed himself on, on healing again. Even though he's teaching and preaching in meetings, he said that he'd wake up sometimes in the middle of the night and he'd just read scriptures and quote scriptures on healing and he's stirring his faith up. And then over a course of several days, his faith got really kindled up high and he was prompted and he spoke to that situation concerning his child. Glory to God. And what do you think happened? Well, it cleared up and the child was healed. But can you see how a lot of times people are too quick to just say stuff off the top of their head and there's no power in it and there's no faith in it? And that's what we're talking about here, what people call faith, but there is a fake faith. There is a phony faith. I'm not interested in that, are you? Should we be checking up on ourselves on a regular basis? So let me encourage you again now. Don't judge other people, but every time you hear come out of your mouth, I'm believing for, I'm believing that. Act on this verse and examine yourself. Am I really believing this? And what is it based on? Faith is not based on nothing. Faith is based on the most sure thing in the universe. Faith in God is based on what God said. Faith in me would be based on what I said. And what if I hadn't said anything? <laughs> then how are you going to believe it? Now, I know already from just what I'm saying, you know, some people are looking at me going, yeah. Others are going, huh. <laughs> because there, there's just some confusion in these areas, but it's real simple. Check up on yourself. If you're not confident, if you're not sure, if you don't know what it's based on, then don't just be talking. It hurts your faith. And if this is your first time with us in this session, the previous ones, we've already covered a lot of ground. You can get those. You can download them for free on the Internet. You can go back into Word Supply and get the previous uh, uh, sermons and parts of this. Go with me, if you would, over to uh, 1 Timothy, the first chapter. 1 Timothy 1 and 5. He said, now the end of the commandment is charity or love. Out of a pure heart and a good conscience and faith unfeigned. Faith unfeigned. Notice the company that unfeigned faith is in. A good conscience, clear conscience, and love out of a pure heart. This is one of the ways you can tell real faith. True faith, real faith, is accompanied, works with, and by love. You remember Galatians 5, 6? If you would put it up on the screen in the Amplified for us, please. Galatians 5, 6. It says... In Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith. Faith that is what? King James says faith which works by love. But faith that is activated, energized, expressed, working through love. Real faith works through love. You show me real faith, I'll show you some real love around it and in it, and by it, and through it. Because real faith would be the God kind of faith. Yes, well, God is love. So you could say real faith is the love kind 
of faith. Said out loud, real faith faith works works by love, love. through love. love. Now, with that in mind, what we're touching on today is that there are People have called a number of things faith, and it's not real faith, and one of the ways that you can tell it's not is by its noticeable absence of love. People have become pushy and demanding, and arrogance has been displayed in the name of faith. People have been too forward and have asked for things they shouldn't ask you for. And in their mind, it's some kind of a warped idea of faith. Did I just step up and require you to do what I want done and, and push you? I was traveling with uh, some folks. I mean, this has been many years ago, and we were in the uh, airline terminal, and there were some things going on, and sometimes they have difficulty with their schedules. And uh, this fella just stepped up to the counter and just was rude to this lady. And I guess he saw the look on my face. I, I kind of stepped back, <laughs> hoping they wouldn't link us together, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and he looked at me, and he said, well, he said, uh, I know that seems a little strong. He said, but that's just my prophetic anointing. <laughs> No, that's called flesh. (laughs) It got nothing to do with no prophetic anointing. But do you know what I'm talking about? A number of people have gotten warped in their thinking, and they've become pushy, and they're demanding, and they're too forward, and they call it faith. They call it boldness. <laughs> huh? Yeah. But if God was really in it, what would you see in it? Love. God is love. There's nothing that God is in that you can't find love in because he is love. And if he's in it, love's in it. And if there's no love in it, he ain't in it. I know that may sound oversimplified, but it's the truth. It's the truth. If he's in it, love's in it. And if it is real faith, all real faith works by love. Now, when we first began talking about true faith, we looked at an example of the uh, Israelites that God brought out of Egyptian bondage and was bringing into the promised land. And when they searched out the land and the, the spies said, uh, oh, it's wonderful, just like the Lord told us. But 10 of them said, we can't go in. It's too many giants, too big. And the Lord told them, go up and possess the land. And they wouldn't do it. In fact, the Bible said they rebelled against the commandment of the Lord. They wouldn't go up and possess the land. They sat in their tent and they cried and they felt sorry for themselves and they said, we all going to die out here in the wilderness. Well, then the Lord said, all right, turn around and go back into the wilderness. And uh, then they, they saw they'd blown it <laughs> and they said, no, we'll go up. We'll go up right now. We're going to go take the land. And Moses said, no, no, don't you go. The Lord has told you don't do it now. Now go back into the wilderness. Don't rebel against him. They said, no, we're going. We're going. So the Bible said they went presumptuously up the hill. Are they calling this faith? Yeah. Yeah. They're going to go take the land. But now get the picture. This fake faith is contrary. It's stubborn. It's argumentative. It it won't submit to authority. It's rebellious. The Lord said, go up. So what'd they do? They wouldn't go. Go sit in the tent and cry. Then he says, all right, go to the wilderness. What do they say? Now we're going to go up. He said, don't go up. I told you don't go. Now we're going by faith. 
How many can see rebellion is completely incompatible with faith? And yet, you know, don't call any names, don't testify. But have you seen anything like what we're talking about? That people get so pushy and insistent and so forward and demanding and won't listen to anybody and don't need anybody because they got faith. And they're just going to do it all by faith. And there's a rebellious air to it. There's a stubborn hard-headedness to it. And there are people that actually are deceived into thinking that their stubbornness is justified somehow because this is faith. But it's not. I said it's not. Listen to the scripture. Deuteronomy 32, 20, talking about this very situation. Deuteronomy 32, 20, he said, they are a very froward generation, children in whom is no faith. The living Bible said, they are a stubborn, faithless generation. Notice what's linked together. Stubborn and what? Faith. No faith. Stubborn and faithless. I've seen it for some years now. It just gets clearer to me all the time. You show me somebody that really is in faith, I'll show you some humility every time. Faith is not a cover for arrogance. You think about the two people that Jesus remarked as having great faith. What kind of people they were? The centurion. Remember him? He said, Lord, I'm not worthy you should come under my roof. I'm just a soldier. I'm just a fighting man. But I recognize you got the authority. And if you just say the word, my servant will be healed. I understand he's used to barking orders. And, and really, in a civil sense, he's over Jesus. He could have commanded him this and that, but he had enough spiritual understanding. He didn't command him anything. He said, you don't even need to come to my house. And Jesus said, I hadn't seen great faith like this in the whole nation. Can you see a connection here now? Humility. Great faith. The Syrophoenician woman, same type of thing. Jesus said, it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to dogs. Now, a lot of people, man, they couldn't handle that. They'd have said, dogs? <laughs> they, they'd have stood up and said, dog preacher? You, you calling me a dog? I'll tell you one thing. We Syrophoenicians, just as good as you Jews, bless God. Let me tell you about some Jews I know. Some of the stuff they do. Well, she could have had her little say and left without but what'd she do? Come on, what'd she do? She said, truth, Lord. Truth. What does that mean? Come on, let me help you out here now. The, the Lord says you a dog. What do you say? Bow wow. Bow wow. <laughs> <laughs> huh? <laughs> truth, Lord. What'd she say? Tr truth, Lord. What does that mean? Whatever you say. Whatever you say, that's how it is. She said, but you know, the dogs get crumbs. Right? Humility. Humility. He said, woman, <laughs> great is your faith. And how many know her daughter got delivered and healed? Right then. Pride is completely incompatible with faith. If people are operating in pride and pushiness and arrogance and demanding that's not real faith. That's a phony, fake faith. Doesn't work. Turn with me to uh, 2 Corinthians 11. If you read 1 and 2 Corinthians carefully, you'll find that Paul is having to deal with something by the Spirit of God. And that is... These are people that came in under his ministry. They got saved under his ministry. The, this church was born under his ministry. He is their father in the faith. He tells them, 
You may have 10,000 instructors, but you only got one, one daddy in the faith like me. Right? And the reason why he's having to talk about these things is because some other people have come in proclaiming themselves to be, and, and I'm quoting from some Greek uh, tra transliteration and other translations, super apostles they are. And they are making light of Paul's ministry and they are saying he is too weak. Now, if you haven't seen this, read, particularly 2 Corinthians, read it carefully, and, and you'll see what I'm talking about. They're accusing him of being too weak and basically that his time is past and now they're moving on to higher levels. Sound familiar? And that Paul, you know, his little revelation is, is you know, that was good to get started on. But now we're going to take you on. Super apostles. Now you'll find this also, the more people get off, the, the bigger they get on titles. I saw somebody the other night was advertising and, and they were saying that they were the master prophet. I thought, that's a new one on me, I didn't know. Master prophet. So you got prophets and then you got master prophets and you got Apostles, and you got super apostles. Somebody said, what's wrong with that? A lot. Now around here, you know, we don't use titles at all. I am a pastor, but I don't use the title pastor. How many of the Lord said, don't refer to each other as master? our father, but brother, right? And for instance, apostle. You know, we talk a lot about the apostle Paul. Do you know he never referred to himself that way? Ever. He never used the word apostle as a title. He said, I am an apostle. Don't take my word for it. Prove your case with the Bible. <laughs> on the other side. But the reason I say it is because people get off with these titles. And that's what these guys were doing. Super apostle. Just smile and be happy, everybody. <laughs> it's going to be okay. <laughs> they said, well, if they take my title away, what will I have? That's a good question. <laughs> that's a real good question. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 11. <laughs> oh, help us, Lord. 2 <laughs> Corinthians eleven thirteen 13 says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Who made them apostles? They made their self apostles. <laughs> are they real apostles? not of the Lord. They are false or fake apostles. We were talking about fake faith and there's fake apostles and there's fake prophets. But how many of that doesn't do away with the real thing? Just like there is a real faith, there also are real apostles and real prophets just like there's real pastors and teachers and evangelists. Verse 14, and no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. How many know the devil never comes in a red suit <laughs> with a pitchfork? <laughs> with a name tag. It says devil. <laughs> he's tricky. He's, he's a deceiver. He, pass, he, he endeavors to pass himself off. I know a fellow one time was trying to tell me, he, he came up arguing with me about something I had taught from the Word. He said, well, well, he said, I, I hear all that. He said, but I had a vision, and I saw an angel, and the angel told me, and it was completely contradictory to the Scriptures I had read that day. I said, well, my brother, what about the Bible? It doesn't agree. 
He said, well, yeah, but I know what I saw. I said, sir, I don't doubt that you saw something. I don't doubt you saw an angel. I don't doubt that it was real. But that doesn't make it God. I don't know that he enjoyed it or not, but I said, brother, I said, I don't care. If, if a 50-member angel choir descends through the ceiling tomorrow morning as you're waking up and sings to you in multiple harmonies with a light show, if it disagrees with this book, it ain't God. It may be spectacular. It may be spirit. How many understand? Satan himself tries to pass himself off as an angel of light, doesn't he? And he's fooled a lot of people with a lot of things. And that's one reason why you need to read your Bible every day and you need to be fed on the Word. Why? So you recognize stuff that's wrong, not just be moved by spiritual experiences. There are things that are real. They are real and they are spiritual. And they are not God. But the enemy tries to pass himself off that way. He said, Satan himself has transformed him into an angel of light. Verse 15, therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. Uh, where are these ministers he's talking about? They're, they're in the church. <laughs> Probably preaching somewhere this morning. <laughs> You're laughing, but where are they? They're not just in the church, first church of Satan. You know, one of the devil's favorite things, his first uh, preference was be that nobody believes there is a devil. It gives him freedom and liberty to move around. And to say and do stuff. He's very, very subtle. He's very deceptive. You talk about an actor. He invented acting. But it's, don't, don't get concerned to go, well, I, man, how can I tell the, the, the real from, from the wrong? Well, the book, we've already talked about this. Check everything by the book. But also I'd say this. One of the biggest things, one of the biggest differences between God and the devil, and there are many, <laughs> is simply this, love. God is love. The devil has no love, can't love, is devoid of love. And so if it's God, you're going to see this love in it. Every time. But notice what, that's what he's trying, the Spirit of God through him is endeavoring to get them to see about their new and improved super apostles that are replacing him and making him obsolete. Keep reading. He said, verse 19, you suffer fools gladly seeing yourselves are wise. They think they are. For you suffer if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on the face. How many understand this is what these guys were doing? They were being pushy. They were being demanding. And somewhere or another they thought, oh man, look at them. Look how bold they are. Whew. He said, I speak as concerning reproach as though we had been weak. He said, you thought we were weak because we didn't treat you like that and push you around. And some way or another, you think that they are a superlative apostle to us because they're so pushy and so demanding. This is not God. In fact, he had to, he, he's talking to them because they said, you know, his letters are real bold. But when he's there in person, he's just so meek. He's just a little weak guy. And he's having to tell them, uh, you don't want me to come with a rod. <laughs> but people who really walk in love, you could be deceived into thinking they're naive or that they're weak. Right? 
because they're not, they're not pushy, they're not demanding. You know, as Christians, we have authority in Jesus' name over demons, Amen. over disease. Yes, we have a right to command demons to shut up and leave, command disease to get out. We don't have a right to command each other like that. Amen. No, we don't. Not each other. And real leaders of God, they will lead. And they won't let you lead them. But if you don't want to follow, they will not try to make you follow. It's completely up to you. Can you see this? Isn't that how God is? Will God make you do something? He will not. Now the devil, if you don't stop him, he'll run everything. He's a manipulator. He's a controller. And real faith is accompanied by real humility. Another area where this manifests is, like we said, people being too, too forward and asking and calling it faith. How many remember uh, King Solomon's mother came to ask him a special favor one time? She came and she said, and he treated her with such respect. He, he brought a seat up and had her sit down beside him in the throne room. And she said, I want to ask you something, son. He said, ask, mother, what, whatever. And she asked for a special favor for his brother. And it was a setup, trying to undermine his authority on the throne. And he said, why don't you just ask for the throne for him? Ooh. <laughs> And people died that day. <laughs> and he was right. How many understand? She shouldn't have asked it. Amen. Can you ask things you shouldn't have asked? Yes, How many remember, uh, who was it? Uh, Boanerges, the sons of thunder. Their mother came and had a favorite ass of Jesus one time. You remember that? Yeah. She said, Jesus, I want to ask you something. He said, uh, I would like for you to put my two boys, one on each side of you, in the eternal kingdom. He said, you don't know what you're asking. Now see, we have a right to come to God and ask things. But when you look at people and ask them for things, you can miss it big time. We've had people write into us numerous times and say, well, Brother Keith, you know the Bible said, uh, let your request be made known. So we're letting you know. What we need, well, no, that's not what that verse said. It said, let your request be made known unto God. Well, the Bible said you have not because you ask not. Yeah, ask of God, of God. And what you're getting into is covetousness. Somebody say covetousness. Go with me to uh, Timothy again, please. First Timothy, the sixth chapter. You know, parents need to watch about asking for their kids. For favors and for special treatment. It's not faith. And a lot of people say, Well, I wouldn't ask for myself, but I'm at, and usually that means you shouldn't be asking at all when you start out like that. I tell our staff all the time, don't ask for favors. In the business world, we're doing business with these people that don't ask for favors. There's too many people out there, churches and preachers, begging with their hand. Can you help the church? Can you give the church a discount? Can you, do you have a preacher discount? Uh, you know, do you have a man of God discount? Uh, do you have a, any kind of discount? That's pitiful. That's, that's pitiful. That's being a beggar, not a believer. Amen. And there's some people who are so distorted in their thinking that they think some way or another this is faith. That if I'll just ask enough, that's some kind of faith. No, you're supposed to ask God and believe and expect Him. And then let Him use whoever He wants to. And if He doesn't deal with them, you leave them alone. Well, we need to get this straight. People ask things of people they should not ask. And now listen, if they're foolish enough to ask you, you just be bold enough to tell them no. They're putting pressure on you, putting you in an uncomfortable position, trying to look to you to meet their need, looking to you as being their provider. Then just, just say no. 
You don't want to do things because people put pressure on you. That's not being led by the Lord. You can waste seed. You can miss God like that. 1 Timothy 6, are you there? 1 Timothy 6 and 10. 6.10 says, For the love of money is the root of all evil. Not just money itself. The what? The love of the money, which while some coveted after, they have what? They have what? They, they've got into error where faith is concerned because of coveting. Now listen, I know how the enemy works. He, he tried to do some of this stuff with me in the beginning of days of me learning how to live by faith. I'm, I know one particular thing I was believing for. This was many years ago. And somebody I knew got one. And, the, and I knew what kind of person they were. They, uh, they, they'd do anything the Lord told them to. If the Lord told them to give it to me, uh, they would have. I knew that. And the devil began to bring thoughts to my mind. Well, uh, he is dealing with them to do it, but you need to claim it. Now, of course, I never said a word to them, thank God. <laughs> but the enemy kept bringing those thoughts to my mind. You need to claim that so God could have a right to deal with them. Error. Somebody say error. error. What, what, is that faith? No, sir. What is it? Is covetousness. I have a right to claim one, not theirs. Amen. Never theirs. Well, the Lord told me that they were going to give it to me. Well, then keep your mouth shut and watch. Find out if you heard right or not. Say not a word to them. If he really is dealing with them, you don't want to get in there and muddy the waters. But there's a bunch of stuff going on in the name of faith. People dropping hints. They're going, hee, hee, hee. Is God dealing with you to give me that? Hee, hee, hee. That ain't funny. We live by faith. Faith is serious business to us. We, if God deals with us, we obey him. Right? God deals with other people and they obey. This ain't games. This ain't playing. And it is not faith to be dropping hints and to be asking people for stuff and pulling and asking and pulling. No, don't you be deceived now. The Lord is not dealing with you to claim something that belongs to somebody else. He can get you your own. And he may not use them at all. Amen. Right? Amen. And if he does, that's between them and the Lord. Amen. Not you. Is this okay? Can you see what covetousness will do with faith? Cause them to err from the faith because of the covetousness. I know years ago when I first got to Ramah, uh, Brother Hagen uh, Sr. was teaching uh, healing school and I was helping there as a volunteer. And a uh, young Ramah student sent him a note. <laughs> I guess I'll always remember it. Brother Hagen had a red Bronco that he drove in the wintertime. It was four-wheel drive. This would have been, I don't know, 25 years ago. And uh, this young Rama student let him know that he had claimed his Bronco, <laughs> and he believed he received it, and that it was his, and that he would let him continue to drive it through the Christmas season. <laughs> but then he'd be ready to pick it up. Now, the reason I'm talking about this is he's calling this faith, isn't he? And I don't know the young man's heart. He might have been deceived about some of this. He might have just been just this ignorant about faith. But, but again, how can you tell that it's not real faith? Such an absence of love. How many understand love wants you to have it? More than me. Right? If one of us has to do without it a while, love would rather I'm the one did without. You enjoy it. I believe God for one of my own. Right? But covetousness is willing for you to sacrifice so I can get what I want. And I notice Brother Hagin kept that thing 
for year after year after year and drove it till we thought the wheels would fall off. <laughs> Something in him made him want to keep that truck. <laughs> after it was old and wore out, we kept telling Brother Hagin, get you a new truck. He said, ah, this is just fine. I like my Bronco. <laughs> so that guy never got close to that Bronco. <laughs> People who know real faith, this stuff bothers them. Yes, it, does. It, it annoys them. Because it's the kind of thing that brings reproach yes. on legitimate believers and those that walk by faith. Let me go over again real slowly. How many know, even from the beginning in the Ten Commandments, it's written, Thou shalt not covet. You don't covet your neighbor's wife or husband, you don't covet your neighbor's house. Are your neighbor's car? Are your neighbor's clothes? Are your neighbor's jewelry? Are your neighbor's donkey? Are your neighbor's anything? Right? You do not cut that. Me. Let me. Let me break it down a little, a little closer. You don't claim it. Well, the Lord told me to claim it. No, He didn't. No, He didn't. No, He didn't tell you to claim their stuff. It's deception. It's error. And beware of asking for things. Like we're talking about, you want to tell the staff, don't ask for favors. A lot of people ask for favors because they're lazy. They just want other people to do their job for them. So they're always asking for favors. Well, could you do this for me? Could you do that for me? You do that, people get tired of hearing you call. And then something come up and you really do need a favor, they're not inclined. But if you never ask for favors. How many of you have got two kind of people in the world? Givers and takers. <laughs> Which one are you? Giver. How would you know you're a taker? You always want something. Every time people see you, they wish, you know, they try to avoid you. Because they know you're going to ask for something. <laughs> you, that, you always want something. And anytime you get something good, you pull it out and they go, can I have that? Can I wear that? Can I borrow that? Can I use that? Is God dealing with you? <laughs> mm. Makes me want to growl. <laughs> this is ungodly. Hmm? And it's, it's reproachful. It's begging. Believers are not beggars. Are they? What the psalmist say? I've been young and now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken. I've never seen his seed begging. Believers don't have to beg. If God is as big as we say he is, if he can do all the stuff we say he can do, then why are we hollering about preacher discounts? Why are we hollering about, can you give the church a hand? Can you help the church? Can you help the church? Oh, shut up. <laughs> and stand up and be a man and be a woman and quit begging and believe for your own. Yeah. Believe for your own. Yeah. Yeah. Quit dropping these little hints. Yes. Quit pulling. Quit asking for favors all the time. Give favors. Yeah. Don't call them and ask for something. Call them and give them something. Yeah. They'll be glad to see you next time. Yeah. Right? And then if it ever comes up that you need something, they'll be ready to help you. God can deal with them to give you favor and they'll be ready to do it. Because they've known you for three years and you've never asked for anything. Then if something does come up, you'll pray and ask God for favor and he'll deal with them without you saying a word. And their heart will be inclined to you and they'll do favors for you. But not because you pulled on them. Not because you asked. When it comes to personal things, you don't have to ask anybody. You don't have to tell anybody. You can just tell the Lord. Just you and him. And he'll do it. And when it happens, you'll be so excited because you know nobody knew. Had to be God. I told him the first service uh, some years ago. I saw a guitar that I just thought was beautiful. It was a limited edition Gibson Les Paul gold top. Some of the top players in the world, that's what they play. And uh, I, I, I don't play much, but I like that guitar. And I thought, I'd like to have that. I'm, I'm in my car by myself. I said, Lord, I'd like to have one of them. I'm just asking for one right now. 
in Jesus' name. I believe I receive one. Nobody in the car but me. Nobody heard it. Phyllis didn't know it. Nobody knew it except the Lord. Of course, he's enough. And several months passed. I'm in another state having a meeting. Had a great service that night. I come out. I've got a rental car. I'm right by myself. I got a rental car. And I came out to get in the car. And before I, I saw something on the trunk. I thought, what is that? I got out and I looked. It's a guitar case. It said Gibson on the outside. I thought, uh-huh. Uh-huh. So I, before I got in, I had to open up and look what's inside. I, I opened up. What do you think? What do you think? Pull back the velvet cover. Gibson Les Paul, gold top. I, you know, how would anybody have known? No, not a soul knew. I didn't tell anybody. Phyllis didn't know. Nobody knew that I had asked for one of those. How many know that helps your faith? You know God is real. God heard you. Not you plus anybody, just you. And he moved supernaturally. Now, when it comes to the church, this is not just mine and Phyllis's stuff. We're going to tell you what's going on. We're going to tell you what we're believing. But for my personal stuff, I don't have to tell you anything. We don't have to tell you anything. You don't have to tell anybody anything. And you need to watch about telling things lest you be in a fake faith or dropping hints or asking for favors. Say it out loud. Real faith. Real faith. Real faith, Real faith. Real faith. Real faith. Works by love. Just close your eyes right now. Covetousness is ugly. Make up your mind you'll have no part of it. If somebody's got something nice like what you'd like to have, you're glad for them to have it. You're not coveting their stuff. God will give you your own or better. Hallelujah. Everybody said out loud, Father God, I repent for any fakeness. I repent for any lack of love any covetousness, any asking when I shouldn't have, any dropping hints, playing with the things of God. I repent. Your things are holy. Your faith is real and precious and powerful. I will not look to man to meet my needs. I will not put pressure on anybody. My eyes are on you. I look to you. My faith is in you. And my love is toward others. And my faith works by your love. Hallelujah.